Survival horror is one of my favorite genres. Those who have seen some of the other content on this channel won't be surprised to hear me say that. It's also been in an interesting place in recent years since it fell out of favor in the mid to late 2000s. Back in the day, survival horror was dominated by two franchises, Resident Evil and Silent Hill. There were a lot of other games out there, of course, Clock Tower, Alone in the Dark, Eternal Darkness, Fatal Frame, but the conversation around survival horror as a whole has always been dominated by those two franchises. Resident Evil was the schlocky B-horror franchise with a broad appeal. It was the franchise which popularized the genre and has continued to be prominent all the way up to the modern day. Silent Hill, meanwhile, was the classier cousin to Resident Evil's bombast. Quieter, more introspective horror focused on unsettling the player and telling a story. Neither of these franchises, at least when comparing the original three games in each, is better than the other. Resident Evil is one of my favorite game series of all time, and as far as I'm concerned, the original three Silent Hill games are basically unassailable. That's not a hot take, I know. As time went on, though, things got weird for both franchises. And as they did, things got weird for survival horror as a whole. Resident Evil 4 is a fantastic game, but it's much less focused on survival horror and much more concerned with being a bombastic action movie you can play. It basically invented modern third-person shooters to do that, but it also signaled the franchise moving away from its horror roots. Silent Hill 4 The Room is... a game that exists. It's fine. I remember basically none of it aside from the first-person sections in the apartment, and I most recently played it, like, three years ago, around the beginning of quarantine. Resident Evil moved on to abandon its horror roots entirely, and Silent Hill went directly into the toilet following the room. Resident Evil 5 is bad, Resident Evil 6 is worse somehow. Again, none of this is a hot take, I know. When Silent Hill re-emerged with P.T., one of the best horror games and probably the most influential horror title of the past decade, it was completely different from what came before. Maybe Silent Hills itself would have been more traditional, but we'll probably never know. When Resident Evil reinvented itself with RE7, it did so by returning to the roots of what made those games great while marrying that with more modern controls and shooting. Resident Evil 2 Remake is one of my favorite games of all time, but it's also not really a remake of Resident Evil 2 in the way the original remake was of RE1. It does not play the same way, or even like a modernized version of the original. It's a reimagining of RE2 in the style of RE4. All of that is to say, while survival horror in 2023 is perhaps in the best place it's been in a decade, with games like the Dead Space remake, and the Resident Evil 4 remake, and the System Shock remake, Coming out to great acclaim, and games like Alan Wake 2 and A New Amnesia on the horizon, the genre is completely unrecognizable from what it once was. If you want to play something like those PS1 classics, you don't have much in the way of options. Tormented Souls plays the right way but didn't really do it for me. The medium was okay, but there's no survival or combat element at all. Layers of Fear, Soma, Lost in Vivo, all good games, but none quite captured the spirit of classic PS1 survival horror. It's been hard to find a game with this specific appeal for quite some time. Enter Signalis. Signalis is that game. Signalis plays like a classic survival horror game. You can even turn on tank controls if you want to. Signalis wears its inspirations on its sleeve, but also manages to feel fresh. It's obviously modernized, it wouldn't literally run on a PS1, but it feels like it could absolutely be at home with the PS1 Resident Evil games or with the first Silent Hill. This is the survival horror game I've been wanting for quite some time. 
a game that feels bold enough that if it had been released back in 1998 or so, it could have been seen as a third pillar of PS1 survival horror alongside the greats. It borrows from classic survival horror and even further back from classics of horror cinema and literature, but manages to have its own unique identity. Signalis is a great game, and today, I'd like to talk about why. Signalis is a 2022 survival horror game released for PC, Nintendo Switch, PlayStation 4, and Xbox One. Signalis was the debut game by the German duo known as Rose Engine. In Signalis, you play as LSTR 512, otherwise known as Elster. You are an Elster model replica, essentially a bio-organic robot forming the backbone of the Yusan nation. A spacefaring nation in which the game takes place loosely implied to exist within our own solar system in the far future. The characters of Signalis are either replicas, which as mentioned are basically robots grown out of flesh and bone alongside metal, or gestalts, which are regular humans. You end up interacting with far more replicas than gestalts during the game for reasons which will eventually become clear. You awaken aboard Penrose 512 after a voice tells you to wake up. There are gaps in your memory, but you were a part of a deep space exploration mission, searching for inhabitable planets as a two-person team, one replica and one gestalt, and you seem to have crash-landed on some frozen alien planet. After exploring the ship, you open the cryopod where your corresponding Gestalt officer should have been stationed during the crash landing, only to find it empty except for a keycard. In the pilot seat, you find a photograph of your Gestalt officer, Ariana Young. In the pilot seat, you find a photograph of your Gestalt officer, Alina Sio, and so you set out into the frozen wasteland to search for her. Soon you come across a strange stone structure, a gate. Beyond the gate, you find a great red pit, with thin stone stairs spiraling downward. You descend into the pit, and find a hole just small enough to crawl into. A strange scarlet light gives way to an unexpected sight. A small room just large enough for one person. In the room is a safe, with three padlocks securing it, a radio, and a book sitting on the desk. The book is the King in Yellow. You take the book, and the radio crackles to life. Aktung, Aktung, danger, it says. A numbers station repeats a code. As the code repeats, you're given glimpses, brief snippets of places, of phrases. You can see Ulster's skin peeling away, decaying. You can see an island. More on that later. Great holes secretly are digged, where Earth's pores ought to suffice, and things have learned to walk that ought to crawl. Remember our promise, the game says. Wake up. We get a flash of a white-haired girl and a reboot screen before we get our title card. Signalis. Then, you are somewhere else. Chapter 1. Synchronization. You press on into the facility, looking for Alina Sio, one of the workers there. If you've played any of the PS1 survival horror titles I mentioned above, then the way Signalis plays is immediately going to feel familiar to you. You are wandering around a facility called Sierpinski, being stalked by enemies, in this case the replica staffing the facility. A sickness is ravaging Sierpinski, affecting the replica and gestalts stationed there alike. Early on, you're told that all of the gestalt workers have been sent down into the mines below, so if you're going to find Alina, that's where you'll need to look. You can find Alina's diary early on, which gives insight into how the sickness there is affecting Gestalts. Nausea, hair loss, dizziness, 
Very concerning symptoms, but nothing too bizarre. The replica, though, are showing much more disturbing symptoms. They are growing out of control, becoming horrifying creatures of rampaging flesh and being driven insane. They stalk the halls looking for those unaffected and chasing them down in a violent rage. Each enemy variety in the game represents a different replica. Your basic enemy type here are Yules, which are the basic low-cost replica units, now essentially zombies who will chase you down with knives. Other units, though, have warped in stranger ways, like the Storch units, who have been distorted beyond recognition, or the Calibri units, who use bioresonance, the game's term for psychic powers, to overload the game's display with superfluous information and appear with a bloated, overgrown head. Of note is that each replica unit is named for a different bird in German. Elster means magpie. Huel means owl, Colibri means hummingbird, Storch means stork, and so on. There are various weapons throughout the game, the first of which is the basic 10mm pistol. In order to save ammunition, you'll want to only shoot enemies enough times to knock them down, and then stomp their heads in while they're stunned on the ground. In a mechanic pulled almost directly from Resident Evil Remake, dead enemies won't always stay dead and may get up and attack again after a time if left intact. In order to prevent this, the game gives you a very limited number of thermite flares, and later a flare gun which can burn dead enemies in order to keep them from getting back up. You aren't given even remotely enough flares to deal with every enemy, so you'll want to be very careful which enemies you choose to burn, opting only to deal with those in high traffic areas you'll return to over and over again. The gunplay is very similar to classic Resident Evil. You aim with one trigger and shoot with the other, or with one of the face buttons. Aiming is only really used to point in a general direction, as Elster will automatically target an enemy in the direction you point her. This actually ends up being perhaps the biggest problem with the game mechanically. An excellent addition to the game's user interface, as opposed to classic survival horror games, is a reticle appearing over whatever enemy is targeted, so there's less of an element of uncertainty or chance to whether your shots will hit your target or not. The problem is, the auto-aiming doesn't always work very well, especially if there are multiple enemies coming at you at once. You'll always want to prioritize a charging target over someone who's already been knocked to the ground, but getting the reticle to disconnect from one target onto another is unreliable, and usually ended in me taking more damage than it felt like I should have. For the most part, though, the game's combat is reliable, especially since, in my experience, combat should only ever be used as an absolute last resort. This isn't an action game. It places its emphasis on survival, and supplies are too limited to take every enemy out, especially on the game's highest difficulty. In every situation, I found myself avoiding a fight if I felt it was at all possible, first by quietly sneaking my way through a room, and then by running when possible. The game's enemies won't notice you unless you make noise, or get relatively close to them, or otherwise perform an action that will get their attention, like flicking on a flashlight or turning on your radio. This is excellent, because it leads to many extremely tense moments of quietly, carefully walking through a room with three or more enemies, holding your breath to make it to the door into the next room. Speaking of room transitions, as mentioned before, Signalis has an option to turn tank controls on, and I highly recommend you don't do that. This isn't me hating tank controls in general. I actually think tank controls get way too much of a bad rap, as they existed in old survival horror games for a very specific reason. In classic fixed-camera Resident Evil games, tank controls serve their purpose because you are not positioned relative to the character, but in a fixed position in each room, each screen. 
tank controls aren't bad in, for example, the first remake, because the game itself was designed with those tank controls in mind. When you transition between screens, the sudden shift in camera perspective would make controls relative to the character suddenly switch directions. One moment you might be running forward, and the next you're running backwards. Tank controls fix that problem, because forward always moves the character forward, regardless of your relationship to them in space. Signalis, though, is neither over the shoulder nor fixed angle in the way something like Remake is. Signalis is seen from a top-down perspective the whole game. Because I have a respect for tank controls in something like Resident Evil, when I saw tank controls as an option in Signalis, I started by turning them on, but they actually highlight exactly what situation tank controls are useful in by virtue of the camera perspective making them irrelevant. Signalis is a top-down game. It doesn't change camera perspectives within a given room. You are always positioned in the same place relative to the character, and so the standard controls simply make more sense. It's a cool feature to include, but I think it makes the game experience much worse, so go ahead and keep those turned off. Speaking of setting, Signalis has three combat difficulties which you can adjust at the start of the game. I played through the game twice for this video, my first time through on normal, and my second time through on the harder survival difficulty. If you're a fan of survival horror games, I'd recommend starting on survival, as Signalis is definitely on the easier side of things. My first playthrough, I only died once the entire time, and found myself drowning in ammunition and healing items by the end of the game. My second time through on survival was notably harder, but still not too bad. I only ended up dying to one of the game's three boss fights, the first boss, Mina, and then a handful of other times throughout the game. To give you some idea, I ended up getting all of the achievements for Signalis, and the last achievement I got was the one for dying 16 times during the same game. I ended up needing to reload a save at the end of the game and running to die repeatedly in order to get the achievement. 16 deaths is admittedly kind of a lot for a 6 to 9-ish hour game, but it's still telling that I had to go out of my way for it, even on the highest difficulty. While there's no story content locked behind the combat difficulty itself, it's worth noting that it might affect which ending you end up getting, due to the way Signalis handles its ending. I think I hate how Signalis handles choosing which ending you get. I'm not going to spoil anything specific about what actually happens in any of the endings yet, but I am going to talk about how the game determines which ending you get mechanically, so if you don't want to hear that, I'll put in a timestamp in the description to skip ahead. The game has three primary endings, and the way you play throughout the game determines which ending you end up getting. Playing very conservatively throughout the game, fighting very few monsters, and taking very little damage, will result in getting what I'll call Ending A to avoid spoilers. Playing very aggressively, killing almost every enemy in the game, taking lots of damage, and going long amounts of time without healing, will result in a more aggressive ending which I'll call Ending C. And the ending which I'm guessing most players, including myself, will get their first time through is a more balanced ending, which I'll call Ending B. I really don't like the way these endings are handled, particularly because it seems extremely difficult to get the aggressive C ending on higher difficulties. I went out of my way on my survival playthrough to fight everything I could with the supplies I had, and only healed my character under extreme circumstances, and I ended up getting ending B again as I had on my first playthrough. The way the ending is calculated is kind of complicated. You can look up the specifics on what's happening online, but part of the problem here is that ending C, the aggressive playthrough, is also tied to how long you take to complete the game, with one of the key sources of points factoring towards getting that ending being a playtime over 12 hours. 12 hours seems really long for this game to me. My first playthrough only took me 9 hours, blind, solving all the puzzles by myself without looking anything up, and my second playthrough was under 6. 
If you're playing more aggressively, then in my experience, you're going to go through faster. But a faster time actually adds points towards the less aggressive ending. I like the idea of giving you an ending based on how you play rather than more artificial dialogue options or something along those lines, but the specific points tied to specific actions seem all over the place and confusing, unrelated, or directly in contrast to the ending they should give thematically, and I couldn't find a way to tell what ending you're on the path for until you see it in the end. My advice is to just get whichever ending you get and then watch the other two endings on YouTube. There's also a fourth secret ending, which from what I can find online, you can't even get until your second playthrough. So if anything, I'd recommend going for that one on a second playthrough. More specifics on the endings in a bit after the spoiler wall. When you're not fighting things, much like in classic survival horror experiences, you'll be solving puzzles. This is, I think, where Signalis really shines mechanically. The puzzles are super diverse and interesting, and it never reuses the same type of puzzle twice, even when I thought it seemed like it was going to. Early on, one of the first puzzles has you doing a little lockpicking minigame where an electronic lockpick has been set up on a door and you have to adjust the lockpick's pressure to get the shear lines to all line up perfectly. The first time I came across this, my heart sank. It's a fine puzzle, but as with most lockpicking minigames, it's only really interesting the first time you do it. I was fully prepared and expecting this little puzzle to show up again and again over the course of the game, even, god forbid, in places where you need to work on puzzles while enemies chase you. The lockpicking minigame never reappears. It never shows up again. You do it once, and then you've solved it, and it is done. Most of the minigame puzzles are like this, and what's more, the puzzles and the combat are segmented off from each other. Generally speaking, each room is either a puzzle room or a combat room. You don't have to worry about trying to solve a puzzle while a corrupted Yule unit is creeping up on you. I think that's a really great choice for this style of game. Solving puzzles while actively in a combat encounter tends to be more frustrating than scary to me. There's this old Penny Arcade comic about Dead Space I think about constantly when it comes to horror games. It's not about puzzles, but it is about being interrupted repeatedly by the same scare in a game. The first time through, Isaac is terrified. The second time through, Isaac casually walks through. By attempt six, the scary worm monster is coaching Isaac on how to beat the next encounter. Familiarity is antithetical to horror. Being interrupted by combat during a puzzle is scary the first time it happens, predictable the second, and tedious the sixth. Perhaps the exception to this being something like Mr. X chasing you in RE2 make, because there, part of what's scary is the uncertainty of exactly how long you have to solve a puzzle before Mr. X reaches you. Sometimes he might not reach you at all in this room, other times he'll kill you while you're moving a bookcase. Segmenting the puzzles and combat encounters into completely different rooms here prevents that sort of frustration from being a concern, which keeps enemies as scary as they ever were throughout the entire game. The puzzles themselves are top-notch, too. I have to say that the puzzles in Signalis might be one of the best overall sets in the history of survival horror games. Typically in a survival horror game, especially a classic-styled survival horror game, there ends up being one or two puzzles in there that completely stump me to the point where I have to look them up, and often it feels like the solution is so strange that I never would have figured it out without external help. Piano puzzle from Silent Hill 1, I'm looking at you. None of the puzzles in Signalis felt unfair. Most of them were challenging. Not one of them did I get so stuck on that I felt the need to look up the solution. These puzzles can vary from as simple as asking you to tune the radio to the correct frequency to find a safe password, to complicated water-moving puzzles or invisible mazes to traverse. If you want to progress, then you'll need to read each diary entry and text log carefully and learn about the world of Signalis and what's taking place there. 
The only puzzle or minigame or whatever you want to call it which I wasn't wild about were the corrupted Calibri units found a few times throughout the game. I mentioned to these guys before that they're using psychic powers to disrupt your screen and fill it with visual noise. What I didn't mention is that the way you stop these guys is by tuning into radio frequencies which get flashed on the screen three times, causing a feedback loop that kills them. Unlike the other puzzles in the game, they throw this exact same task at you every time you encounter the Calibris. The first time I saw these guys shaking like something out of Jacob's Ladder and figured out how to deal with it, it was great. The first time you encounter them, you don't have to worry about being interrupted by combat either. The problem is, these guys show up several more times after that, and in several cases, are in the same room with enemies. The screen is so full of visual noise that fighting guys during this isn't a good option, but trying to fiddle with your radio three times, let alone waiting for the frequencies to flash, while you're dealing with enemies approaching isn't a great bet either. It honestly doesn't feel like there's much of a good way to deal with these situations across the board to me. Still, that's one minor blemish on an otherwise excellent series of puzzles. The only other blemish on which is well, more widely talked about. Inventory in survival horror games has been widely discussed for long before Signalis was even thought of. Resident Evil has the classic inventory Tetris, where each item takes up some space in an inventory, and fitting everything you can into that inventory is very much part of the game. This limitation adds a constant source of stress to the experience, which is part of the design of the game, part of what it hopes to accomplish. Silent Hill, meanwhile, or at least the Silent Hill games people actually like, have unlimited inventory space, because they are set in a much larger area than Resident Evil games typically are, and backtracking all over town because you needed handgun ammo wouldn't have added to the tense psychological horror that the game is going for. Signalis decided to trend in the direction of limited inventory space. Very limited inventory space. Six items on your person at any given time. Period. End of story. I don't think this decision is quite as bad as some people have made it out to be. While Signalis is a very well-received game overall, if you've heard one bad thing about the game, then it's probably the limited inventory. There are some decisions Signalis made which make inventory management much less of a burden than it could have been. Once you use a key item, it's immediately removed from your inventory. No having to worry about whether you'll need the hummingbird key on your person again down the line somewhere. Not even asking the player to check if the item's been checked off to be safe to delete like the Resident Evil games like to do. It's just gone. It handles it for you. If your inventory is full and you come across ammo but there's room in your gun's actual clip, you can reload without actually picking the ammo up. I'm told I didn't ever encounter this in my actual course of gameplay. I think limited inventory itself is fine in a survival horror game. I think generally being forced to choose what items to take with you and what items to leave behind is part of the appeal of these games. Six items though is pretty low. I like some of the choices inventory being this limited forces you to make. It gives Signalis this really expedition-based feeling. Each time I left a safe room, I had a specific route in mind. This time I'm going for the gold key, then I'm coming back. This time I'm going for the fire key, then I'm coming back. This time I'm going for the water key, then I'm coming back. I didn't mind that. Some runs I had to choose whether I was going to take ammo with me or if I thought the 10 bullets in the clip would be enough to get me where I was going and back. Sometimes I had to choose whether I was taking healing items with me, or if I thought I could make it there and back without that safety net. Sometimes I had to choose whether I thought I'd need my flashlight with me, or if I thought I could get by without it. Often I chose wrong when faced with these questions. The problem is, choosing wrong in this case doesn't actually lead to any sort of fun or engaging encounter or situation. If I chose not to take my flashlight with me and then stumbled into a dark room, 
That just meant running back to the safe room and swapping out my inventory. If I couldn't pick up the ammo in a room, that usually meant just running to a safe room, back to the room I was in, and then back to the safe room once again. This highly limited inventory is explained in-universe as the Rule of Six, that Yusan society discourages anyone from carrying more than six items on their person at once, because personal property is a privilege. Which is certainly meant to add to the oppressive totalitarian aspect of the society in the game, but is honestly kind of silly. I don't know, trying to explain the limited inventory mechanic like that just didn't work for me at all. Surely the Yusan government can see the value in having their soldiers carry more than six items at once. As a reminder, you are playing as a military combat engineer. You are a Yusan soldier. God forbid someone working for the Yusan military wanted to carry a gun and six clips of ammo, I guess. Mechanically, there are just some places where this completely falls apart, too. That puzzle I mentioned earlier with the gold key, fire key, water key, and so on, which need to be inserted into a door in order to progress, get ready to make multiple trips there. That door leads right into a safe room, too, so you're actually fine if you wanted to do it in a single trip with the five keys and a gun at your side, but you wouldn't know that your first time through the game. Later on, there's another door in a much more out-of-the-way location that actually requires six keys, so you couldn't do that in a single trip unless you dedicated your entire inventory to it. It really starts to feel like these sections weren't designed with the limited inventory space in mind. Plus, again, it's just kind of silly, the idea that a tiny plastic keycard and a shotgun take the same amount of inventory space to carry. This is why I feel like inventory mechanics in survival horror games are a solved problem already. The inventory Tetris minigame, which has been seen over and over and over again in games for years, works for a reason. You could still have an extremely limited inventory with that kind of system, still force the player to make tough decisions, but also not run into a situation where a shotgun and a single shell for that shotgun are equally weighted. I really feel like if appropriately balanced, that would have worked better here. Where Signalis shines the most is in its aesthetic and sound design. Signalis has a look to it which is immediately captivating. There are so many strong choices here, which absolutely elevate the game. The sound design is truly excellent here. I strongly recommend playing the game with headphones. It gives everything in this world a weight to it. The soundtrack is also top-notch, ranging from melancholy tracks to disjointed metal clangs and screams. It's not the sort of thing I find very listenable outside of the context of the game, but within the context of the game, it's incredible. So much of the soundtrack felt more like ambient sound, like the mine you're descending into was screaming at you, louder and louder the closer you get to the bottom. The game's cutscenes are presented in a pixel art style that evokes older anime, Ghost in the Shell being a stated point of inspiration. These cutscenes are often disjointed, with flashes of images that will end up being vital later on displayed for only a second, with text mixed in, some essential to the plot, some superfluous, just long enough to be read but not really long enough to be processed. Signalis uses these cutscenes to disorient the player, which is part of not only the horror but the story. It wasn't clear to me the first time I played Signalis, but after that title card, the setting has changed. 
Initially, I thought we had merely moved deeper into this facility we found ourselves in, but that's not the case. When we regain control of Elster, we are standing in a bathroom, in a clear reference to the beginning of Silent Hill 2, in a mining station called S-23 Serpinski on the planet Lang, back within the colonized space of Yusan. Other things, too, have changed. I alluded to this earlier, but the photograph you pick up on your crashed ship has changed to picture someone else entirely. Your mission has changed, too. You're still looking for someone, but it's no longer the Gestalt officer aboard the Penrose 512. Now you remember Alina as one of the Gestalt workers within the Serpinski facility. This is sort of Signalis's trick. You lose time in Signalis. Flashes of memory give way to the world having changed. This is the first time this happens, but it will not be the last. Impossible things start to happen. Sometimes they seem like lapses in time until you consider what's actually happening. To jump forward a moment, my favorite example of this comes from right after you beat the game's first boss, Mina. You fight Mina in a small sort of clinic or hospital room. When you beat Mina, the game changes to a more detailed cutscene perspective of a metal door opening, presumably the prominent metal door seen in the boss fight room, as the character of Adler, the Serpinski facility's administrator, steps through. When the game cuts back to a third-person perspective, you're elsewhere, now in the elevator room from much earlier. It happened so suddenly that at first I thought there had been a time lapse, as if Adler had walked with Elster back to the elevator room. But the conversation is uninterrupted. One moment you are in a clinic room, and the next you are in the elevator lobby. It is that dreamlike state of translation from one place to another which goes by so smoothly and without drawing your attention to it that it might go unnoticed that establishes the game's uncanny, surreal nature. Other moments of surreality are more obvious, though. At one point, early on in the game, you find a box with an ornamental butterfly inlaid upon it. When you open the box, you find a strange plate within it, and upon touching the plate, are transported into some kind of memory. Signalis changes perspective from third person into first person for these sequences throughout the game, and here in the first of these memories, you find yourself in a remote radio outpost in the mountains of Rotfront, one of the planets in the Yusan Nation which has not yet been fully climaformed, the game's term for terraforming. Because of this, Rotfront is still a frozen hell, although it is a frozen hell which people have been mandated to live in, as we see in glimpses of the cities of Rotfront throughout the game. While in this memory, you find a radio module compatible with Elster and equip it, allowing access to radio stations required for solving puzzles throughout the game. Upon the memory ending, you'll find that you still have the radio module equipped, a physical item found within an intangible memory. Another such moment of the line between past and present being blurred comes a little later on, when one of the game's first major puzzles has you searching for five keycards throughout the hospital wing of the Serpinski facility. The keys are labeled according to various elements – the fire key, the water key, the air key, and the earth key. The standout oddity among these keys, however, is the gold key. Gold isn't an element in the way something like fire or water are, rather it's an element on the periodic table. Eventually, you find each key within various locations associated with their element – the air key hidden in an air vent, the water key within a flooded section of the hospital the earth key embedded within a rock in the x-ray machine, and the fire key within the hospital's incinerator. The gold key, though, requires you to find a VHS tape and take it to a VCR. Upon watching the tape, you will be transported within the contents of the tape, a memory of a train on Rotfront where you'll see Ariana a memory of a train on Rotfront where you'll see a mysterious white-haired girl riding the train. She disappears from the memory, leaving the gold key behind on the seat. 
When you pick up the key, the memory ends, and you'll find it within your inventory back in Serpinski. Why would the gold key be within a VHS tape? Because VCRs, as well as most other electronics, contain gold used as a conductor. The dream logic the game consistently follows is an essential part of the Signalis experience. I'm not saying I think everything that happens in Signalis is a dream. I don't. I think the events of Signalis are literally happening, but they follow a dream logic. That ethereal quality is a part of what's going on, is a part of this world. I want to talk about what's going on, about what I think is literally going on in this very surreal and metaphysical game. In order to do that, I want to talk about some of the inspirations and homages within Signalis, and how they inform my understanding of what's happening within the game's narrative. In order to talk about what's going on in Signalis, we're also going to have to be able to talk about the story of Signalis in depth. So at this point, I'm going to give you a chance to stop the video. If you haven't played Signalis yet, and it sounds like something you'd enjoy, you should absolutely go give it a try. It's an excellent game. From this point on, there will be spoilers. I'm not going to be cheeky about what's going on in this game. Also, uh, spoilers for The Shining and The King in Yellow, I guess. Do I need to give a spoiler warning for a book published in 1895? Well, I did anyway, I guess. Signalis, and this video covering it, is honestly such an interesting companion to my Fear and Hunger video because of how Signalis uses its references. If you've seen my Fear and Hunger video, which statistically speaking if you're watching this you have, then you know I make a point in that video about how heavy those games are on references. I didn't hate the references in that game, I even thought some of them were pretty fun, but Generally, I don't think they added much to the experience. Signalis, though, is a powerful contrast to that. The references, the homages in Signalis, are a part of the story. It is important to understand what Signalis is drawing from in order to understand what is happening within it. There are several points of reference I want to talk about here because of how essential they are to the narrative. The Shining, the paintings Isle of the Dead and The Shore of Oblivion, and The Mask. Not that one. Yeah, yeah, there we go. I'm not saying that you need to have seen The Shining to play Signalis, or need to have read The King in Yellow in order to understand what's going on. I think you can get a perfectly satisfactory experience playing the game in a vacuum. But understanding what works Signalis is drawing from helped me understand what it's saying as an artistic work. It enriches the game. So let's talk about these works before we discuss Signalis's story any further. Of the works referenced in Signalis that I'm interested in discussing here, I suspect that The Shining is the work people will be most familiar with. I'm talking specifically about the 1980 Stanley Kubrick film here, not the novel by Stephen King, and that's because if you read the description of Signalis on Steam, they actually list Stanley Kubrick as one of the game's primary influences, alongside David Lynch and Hideaki Anno. The Shining is the story of the Torrance family, Jack Torrance, Wendy Torrance, and their son Danny Torrance, who go to stay in the secluded Overlook Hotel as Jack is hired to maintain it over the winter, as the snow makes it inaccessible for months at a time. The problem is that not only is Jack Torrance kind of a complete piece of shit, but the Overlook Hotel is also super haunted. It's like, the absolute most haunted. I really cannot stress enough just how haunted this hotel is. This is made worse by the fact that the young Danny Torrance has the shine to him. He has the touch, Stephen King's recurring flavor of psychic powers, which seems to make him a target for the hotel's ghostly residents. 
As the months stretch onwards, Jack's mental health declines further and further as the ghosts influence him more and more, until he takes an axe and attempts to kill Wendy and Danny. The two are only saved because of Danny using the shine to call to Dick Halloran, the Overlook Hotel's head chef, who also has the shine. The Shining is a story about how isolation can wear you down, how it can drive you to madness. It's also a story about how ghosts can drive you to madness, but that one is less relatable. The Shining is referenced multiple times throughout the game in the form of a recurring carpet pattern. I know that might sound silly, but the carpets of the Overlook Hotel are one of the most iconic things about the film. This reference itself doesn't mean much, a carpet is just a carpet after all, but I believe it's a deliberate choice to make the player make the connection between Signalis and The Shining in their head, in much the same way that invoking the King in Yellow by name sets an expectation for what's happening in the game. Bioresonance is one of Signalis' most underexplained yet pivotal elements. I do not think that it being underexplained is a bad thing, though, as the characters within Signalis not understanding what exactly bioresonance is, is explicitly stated in the game. The replica are called that because they are imperfect copies of the minds of specific gestalts. Their bodies are grown of flesh and bone and metal, and bioresonant individuals upload neural patterns of the original gestalt. The replica are imperfect, however. Though the body and mind are both present, there is something missing that keeps them from being truly human. Or at least, that's the propaganda line being fed to the people by the Yusan nation. This is why the natural-born humans are called Gestalts, a German word referring to something that is more than the sum of its parts. Though replicas and Gestalts both have body and soul, the Gestalts are fully realized, while the replica are seen as less than human. Personally, I think this is all propaganda. The replica we meet all seem just as human as the Gestalts we come across, the difference being the way they are treated and seen. The replica are always referred to as machines, as things, and we see in documentation that gestalts are forbidden from treating them as human. Yet, if you read the classified documentation on replica known issues scattered throughout the game, you can see that they describe psychological issues, ones which are common to each model of replica, doubtlessly because they are copied from the same original human. The documentation uses mechanical terminology to describe psychological issues. Storch units are all sadists by nature, but this is described as their neural pattern being less stable than other models. Yules were copied from the neural pattern of a ballet dancer, and so they crave music. They need some level of entertainment and art to keep themselves from going stir-crazy just like any human would, but this is described as persona degradation can be easily prevented in this unit by making sure they have access to music. Later on in the game, we find a dying Mina unit in the mine below Serpinski, and at first, the game refers to her as Mina until she says her name is Bayo, at which point the game changes her name in the dialogue box. The document describing known issues for the Mina unit even says to avoid giving them access to imagery of cats in order to avoid causing resurfacing of Gestalt memories, or in other words, to prevent her from remembering her life before being enslaved. These replicas aren't robots, they're people. They have their own identities, their own feelings and emotions. They are just being treated as robots by Yusan. Their mechanical affectation comes from being treated as robots, being told they are robots for their entire lives. We even find a star unit in the mine who, in the moments before her death, admits that she remembers her name, her old name, in her previous life. The reason for this, the reason why replica are treated and presented as less human than they are, is because they must be seen as disposable. 
They are the backbone of the Yusan nation. They are the only thing which let the Yusan nation break free from a larger empire which it still finds itself at war with. These replica must be seen as inhuman, as soulless creatures, as machines, in order to use them as soldiers, as weapons, and as slave labor in the mines. In order to do this, the Yusan nation has created a mechanical language to describe something indescribable. They are taking something supernatural, this process of psychically copying the mind, and have hidden its nature in scientific language. It's not psychic power, it's bioresonance. It's not psychosis, it's persona degradation. The Shining, The Shine, The Touch, both as it appears in the Stanley Kubrick film and as it appears in Stephen King's novels, is a mystical power. It is not something which can be described in strict scientific terms. To even try would be foolish, yet that's exactly what Yusan has done. Late in the game, we find a classified document called Bioresonance Technology and Its Limitations, again written in a mechanical, scientific-sounding voice, but which essentially warns that the backbone of all of Yusan's technology, climaforming, artificial gravity, and, of course, the replica, is bioresonance, a force which has still gone completely unexplained scientifically. It even mentions offhand that the process of transferring neural patterns onto a replica host is overwriting existing patterns. These replica are already very much alive before they are psychically overwritten with an entirely new identity. A terrifying thought. I believe that we've become overly dependent on a poorly understood technology controlled solely by a few gifted individuals, the text reads. The Yusan nation is playing with fire, and Signalis shows it getting burned. Don't get me wrong though, the replicas may be treated as disposable and inhuman publicly, but that doesn't mean Yusan treats its true gestalt citizens any better. We'll talk about that a little later on. The most direct reference in the game, the reference which Signalis pushes right into your face and demands that you notice, is to the King in Yellow. The King in Yellow is a play that holds power over those who read it. It is a play in two acts, and it is the height of art. There is no work in any medium better than The King in Yellow, and there never will be. It is an unparalleled achievement in literature, in art, in human history. If you've read The King in Yellow, then you know this to be true. All who read The King in Yellow know this to be true just by reading it, and can often find themselves inspired in fields of art or of science, as if the play's transcendent nature somehow rubs off on them. Inspiration is not the only thing that finds those who read The King in Yellow, though. Those who have read the play's first act might speak of the uncanny horror it relates, the unsettling, creeping dread it places in the heart, a paranoia that follows them, the haunting words at the end of the first act echoing through their mind and through their heart. Those who have as much as seen the pages of the second act, though, are changed. No one has ever made it through the opening line of Act 2 and come back unchanged. It is the height of art, but not of human art. Not for the human mind to hold. The exact effect The King in Yellow has on its readers may vary, but all of them are driven mad. The play itself is quite fake, of course. The King in Yellow is not a real play, at least not the one I'm speaking of here. There are those who have tried to write The King in Yellow, who have thrown their lot in trying to represent the horrors depicted within, but they're all pale imitators. The King in Yellow originates in a short story collection published in 1895, itself titled The King in Yellow, written by Robert W. Chambers. 
Four of the ten stories contained within the book involve the cursed play, and how it changes people, how it inspires people, and how it ultimately destroys those who read it. The King in Yellow has a curious place in the legacy of horror. While it's not as famous as Frankenstein or the collected works of Edgar Allan Poe, it is every bit as important to the following century of horror writers. Famously inspiring H.P. Lovecraft so heavily that he wrote not only The King in Yellow into his own cosmic horror mythos, but wrote Robert W. Chambers in as well. Quite literally, Robert Chambers was to H.P. Lovecraft what H.P. Lovecraft was to Stephen King and countless other modern horror authors. The funny thing about the way H.P. Lovecraft adopted The King in Yellow and the yellow sign associated with it into his own stories is that he did the same thing to Chambers' stories that so many people today accuse modern horror authors of doing to Lovecraft's works. By turning the titular character of The King in Yellow into Haster, part of his pantheon of outer gods, and codifying the yellow sign into something much more concrete, much easier to understand, he robbed Chambers' stories of a lot of their themes, a lot of their power, in the same way turning Cthulhu into a big dumb sea monster misses the point of what made Lovecraft's writings interesting. Now we're in an era where Lovecraft's works are more popular than they've ever been, while Chambers' name is still relatively obscure. I've seen many people online go as far as to credit Lovecraft with the creation of The King in Yellow and The Yellow Sign, as just another part of his universe, his mythos. Signalis, though, is not interested in adapting The King in Yellow or Haster in the way Lovecraft used them. This is truly another King in Yellow tale. In the same way Chambers told strange tales of speculative fiction which, at first glance, didn't always even involve the play directly, so too does Signalis. This is not Lovecraftian horror. This is Chambersian horror. The King in Yellow, as it appears within Signalis, is not the book by Robert W. Chambers. Rather, it is the play itself, the one which causes great inspiration, but also destruction. At first, I thought the inclusion of The King in Yellow would be just a quick way to tell the player early on that this story was dealing with cosmic horror elements, but the meaning goes much deeper than that. The Mask is the second story in Robert Chambers' book, and is prefaced by a snippet from the fictional cursed play, as the characters of Camilla and Casilda are at a masquerade ball. The time has come to unmask, and all others at the ball have done so. Camilla and Casilda tell a character known only as The Stranger that he too should unmask, and he responds that he wears no mask. Camilla shrieks in terror as she understands the implication of this, that whatever horrible visage she is seeing, it is the stranger's true face, and it has been all along. This line, I wear no mask, will sound familiar if you've already played Signalis, as one of the game's most memorable lines comes from Adler as his face peels away, revealing the synthetic flesh and bone underneath. I am whole again, I wear no mask, and I hate everything. Now, understanding what happens in The King in Yellow, the play, is a fool's errand. The entire point of the play is that understanding it would lead to going mad, so concrete details about it are extremely scarce. There are some who think the stranger is meant to be the King in Yellow himself, but I view this character as more of a subservient extension of the King. Perhaps an avatar of him, perhaps just a servant. This is why I think it's excellent the way they give Adler this line, drawing this direct parallel between him and the stranger, because of the way we already know at this point that he has an obsessive, subservient relationship with Falk. Throughout the game, we see posters of Falk, the commander of the Serpinski outpost. Falk units are the so-called super weapons of the Yusan nation. We find Falk in the lowest levels of the Serpinski facility, but she has fallen ill and is comatose. 
In her diary, we can find that she has been subject to the illness that is overtaking the facility in the strangest way. Her mind is being overwritten the same way we know from the bioresonance technology and its limitations text that newly created replicas have their minds overwritten. She keeps seeing the same white-haired girl we've been having visions of, and remembers the two of them being together on Penrose 512, the ship you began on. She is becoming Elster, the same Elster unit we are playing as. Much later, at the end of the game, we face Falk. She has been fully overwritten and has become Elster in her mind. She believes that the two of them cannot exist simultaneously, and so seeks to destroy Elster, as if one of them dies, she thinks the other will be made whole. As she transforms into the final boss of the game, her form evokes the King in Yellow. There's another reason why the mask is the specific King in Yellow tale referenced, though. Unlike the other three King in Yellow tales from Robert Chambers' book, which are all very much horror stories, the mask skews much more closely to gothic romance. The mask is about three principal characters, Alec, our narrator, Boris, a sculptor and best friend of Alec, and Genevieve, Boris's lover. After reading The King in Yellow, Boris found himself supernaturally inspired to create a new chemical formula which can turn organic matter to marble upon touching it. As he describes it, the way inspiration struck him, it all seemed so clear, so obvious how this would be done, that he couldn't believe he was the first to realize it. Being able to instantly turn something to marble is pretty useful if your profession is sculptor, so Boris has filled a small pool with the strange liquid, and is experimenting with submerging things within it. Boris, Alec, and Genevieve are all the best of friends, but there is a love triangle between them, one which has never fully been put to bed. Both Boris and Alec were deeply in love with Genevieve in the past, but when Alec told her how he felt, she chose Boris instead. Rather than this tearing them apart, Alec accepted it and moved on, and the three remained very close friends. Honestly, good guy Alec over here, I was not expecting that healthy of a reaction in a book written in 1895. This all goes horribly wrong when Genevieve falls ill one day and, in her delirium, admits that it is him she loves and not Boris after all. No sooner does she say this than Alec also falls mysteriously ill with a high fever and delirious dreams. When Alec awakens from the illness some time later, he finds that things have gone terribly wrong while he slept. Genevieve, in her delirious state, wandered to Boris's workshop and threw herself into the pool he was using for his experiments, turning herself to marble. Upon seeing what had become of her, Boris takes his own life. There's nothing exceptionally scary about this story, but the themes within it can recontextualize our understanding of the story of Signalis. It's not an accident that this is the story referenced directly. If you haven't played the game, you may not realize it from what I've said about the game so far, but Signalis is also, at its heart, a tragic love story. The time has come to talk about Ariana Young. At the beginning of Signalis, you are looking for Ariana Young, your Gestalt counterpart aboard the Penrose 512. Upon picking up the King in Yellow, you find yourself not on a strange distant planet, but within the Serpensky facility on the planet of Lang, and now you are searching for Alina Sio instead. Your memory has been corrupted as reality itself is beginning to fall apart. You were never meant to be searching for Alina, you were always looking for Ariana. Your memory is faulty, but you need to remember your promise. Ariana is a Gestalt citizen of Yusan who was raised by her mother at a remote radio outpost in the mountains of Rotfront. This is the radio outpost we get a glimpse of in a memory when we get the radio module much earlier. During her childhood, the only other person she had to interact with was her mother, but 
this wasn't really a problem. Far from the prying eyes of Yusan, she had a rich internal life, exploring the world of art and the world of literature. The problem is that these were not things Yusan found value in. The small room from the very beginning of the game, where we first find the King in Yellow, gives us a glimpse into Ariana's world. Old imperial serials, censored by the Yusan government, were her favorite books. Photographs of classic paintings hang from the wall. At some point, when Ariana was perhaps a young teen, her aunt wrote to her mother and convinced her that it would be best for her to come to the city and to attend high school like other children. The game's third chapter, Gestaltzerfall, takes place in a warped memory of the neighborhood where Ariana lived during this time. She would find Mandelbrot High School a cruel place, we get a glimpse of her being bullied through the eyes of Isa Ito, the game's only other Gestalt character physically present, who Ariana knew in her high school days. Isa is another strange, surreal element of the game, as she is out of place, not meant to be in Serpinski. She is in Serpinski looking for her twin sister, Erika, but how she got there and why Erika would be found on Serpinski is unknown. Isa and Erika's parents owned a bookstore near the home where Ariana found herself. They were immigrants from the planet of Veneta, which was destroyed during the War for Independence from the Empire. Elster is also said to be Venetan, or rather the original Gestalt she was copied from was a Venetan soldier during the war, implied to be Lilith Ito, a relative of the twins, most likely an aunt but possibly going back further than that. Lilith Ito served alongside Alina Sio during the war, and when Ariana sees a picture of Lilith and Alina, she realizes that she and Alina look uncannily similar, despite not having any known blood relation and Alina being born at least a generation before. The only major difference between them physically is that Ariana's hair went prematurely gray. She develops a fascination with Alina, her uncanny doppelganger, and feels a kinship with her throughout time. After the war, Alina Sio went to work at the Serpinski mining facility on Lang. Ariana's passion for art made her a target in Yusan society. She was mercilessly bullied in school and continued to immerse herself in art and literature. We find her teacher's note about her, which refers to her obsession with paintings, music, and other nonsense, and notes that her compulsory military service should beat it out of her. This note refers to her friendship with the Ito sisters and the illegal texts being sold in their parents' bookstore. One of those texts was the King in Yellow, calling to Ariana. The other important thing to note about Ariana is that she most likely had the shine. There are notes about an imperial spy living in Ariana's neighborhood in the third act, but this small subplot is concluded by a note left by the spy saying that they believe they've been found out because Ariana is a bioresonant, and that they have to leave immediately. Just like the King in Yellow granted Boris great inspiration, but also destruction, I think that Ariana was exposed to the King in Yellow, which amplified her bioresonant abilities when she would find herself at the darkest point of her life. While you find yourself in the memory of Rotfront at the end of the game, I believe everything I've said here happens well before the events of the game happen. In Rotfront, we can find Ariana's work assignment, which says that following her compulsory military service, she has been assigned to work in the Serpinski facility on Lang. In a last-ditch effort to avoid this, she volunteers instead for the Penrose program, the Yusan Nation's deep space exploration campaign. This is how Elster and Ariana find themselves on the Penrose 512 at the start of the game. We flash back several times to their time aboard the Penrose, and find something unexpected. The Penrose program is designed to be 3,000 cycles long. 
The ship is given enough supplies and rations to last for 3,000 cycles, 3,000 days, and the crew are shot off into deep space to see if they can find any inhabitable planets. This is a low-cost program. One Gestalt officer and one Elster replica aboard every Penrose ship. We can find the orders given to Ariana aboard the Penrose, which say very clearly that the Gestalt officer is not meant to befriend or socialize with their replica counterpart. But beyond the sight of the Yusan nation, Ariana and Elster fell in love. We see them dancing, we see them falling asleep together watching a movie. Here, beyond the furthest reaches of known space, Ariana found joy in isolation. The world she grew up in never had a place for her in it, but now, away from anything, she's found some piece of happiness. It couldn't last, though. In isolation, in the empty abyss of space, Ariana feels a lonely gnawing slowly creep up on her. In a note aboard the Penrose, we hear the way she can feel herself slowly falling apart in isolation. Cycle 1840. Everything is always the same. I feel like I'm trapped inside of this ship. I know every bolt on every panel and every room of it. I've seen everything. I've done everything there is to do in here. I can't concentrate on anything. It's like there's this fog inside my head, and whenever I try to do anything, I just can't focus. I want to go outside, I want to breathe fresh air, I want to feel wind on my face and in my hair. Cycle 2503. I think I lost more hair. I'm sitting here, getting older. Every time I wake up, I feel older, weaker, sicker. I get out of breath so easily lately, and... My back hurts when I sit down. How much longer will this go on? It feels like I'm just slowly dying. The Penrose program is broken into three phases. Phase 1 comprises the first 1500 days of the mission. The ship is shot into the abyss and will take that long to reach the Oort Cluster, the nearest place where habitable planets and valuable resources might be found. The second phase takes the next 1500 days, as the duo look for a suitable planet. Phase 3 begins at day 3000. The orders transmitted read as follows. Congratulations, comrade. You've survived 3000 cycles, reaching the final phase of the Penrose program. With the end of the operational lifetime of your replica unit approaching, it is time to prepare for the final phase of your missions. If you have not found a suitable world for landing by this point, accept that you will not. Find solace in the thought that others might be successful where you failed. As you are probably aware, your ship's spare parts and rations will soon be depleted. Life support systems and reactor shielding will soon begin to fail, and radiation may begin to leak from the cooling system. We recommend you do not attempt to prolong your suffering by reusing old filters or rationing supplies. Instead, make peace with your fate. We suggest that you ask your replica, while it is still functional, to spare you a slow and agonizing death, or that you take a permanent rest in the cryogenic pod. Remember that you will die having served your nation by partaking in a glorious demonstration of our power. There was never a difference between Replica and Gestalt. One was always as disposable as the other. This reveal, the callous way the Yusan nation treats the citizens volunteering for a program that they use in propaganda throughout the system, is the most sickening thing that happens in all of Signalis. This is a type of evil that's far more horrifying to me and strikes far truer than any of the strange flesh creatures we find in the depths of Lang. I don't think Yusan expects any of the Penrose ships to find habitable planets. I don't think there was ever a chance of success on this mission. This is just another form of propaganda. It is clear that Ariana did not know what Phase 3 of the Penrose mission entailed. In the dancing sequence flashback, we find that it's happening on cycle 3000, 
and that the two are awaiting their orders. This moment of peace, of happiness, occurs just before the nightmare begins. Perhaps the most sickening thing is that the ship is named Penrose 512, implying that this has happened to 511 other gestalts and replicas before. Despite the orders telling Ariana not to attempt to prolong her life, we find that she does. The final dated note we find from Ariana is written somewhere in the range of 5400 cycles. The two held out as long as they could, fixing the coolant system, rationing supplies, but they were too far from anything, stranded in the dark abyss of space. We find notes about the fate that awaited Ariana once they could no longer keep the coolant system patched up, losing hair and teeth, getting sicker and sicker with every passing day. Elster made a promise to Ariana, and at first glance, we are led to believe it's a promise that she would not let Ariana suffer without her, and that she would kill Ariana before dying herself. She couldn't keep her promise. In one of the flashbacks to the Penrose, we find Elster's corpse. In the end, Ariana was left truly alone. So how do we get from there to the story of Signalis? If Elster was already dead by the time the Penrose crashed on some strange alien planet, how are we playing as her in the game? How do we get from the depths of space to a mining facility on Lang in an instant, and what's going on as we descend further and further into the mines? There is a read of this game that everything which happens is a dream. Dreams are a recurring theme. The phrase, a dream about dreaming, comes up several times. I think the game is the dying dream of Ariana, but I don't think that means it's not really happening. I think that everything that happens in Signalis actually happens. It actually happens on Lang, and it actually happens on Rotfront. And we are seeing the death of Yusan at the cruel hands of a cosmic god. Ariana has the shine, and the king in yellow is using her from the depths of space. Something was unearthed at Serpinski, something the diaries you find refer to as the flesh beneath Lang. The game's second chapter, Liminality, is set within this flesh, in a space called Nowhere. This is where the game's environments begin to degrade to the point of no longer making any literal sense at all. One of my favorite things the game does here is that not only does the game take your map away for this portion, but the game disorients the player by messing with the continuity of space between rooms. In every other section of the game, if you exit out of a door on the right side of the screen, you'll emerge on the left side of the screen. If you exit through the bottom, you'll emerge from the top. This makes the space make sense, makes it feel like you're moving from one room to the next. Here, in Nowhere, that sense of continuity is gone. You might exit from the left only to emerge from the top, or exit from the right only to emerge from the right once again. It's extremely disorienting and makes this space essentially unmappable, as it doesn't follow any sort of normal geometry. East and west, north and south are no longer constant, but subject to change. Perhaps this is hell. It is a terrible place. Rusted metal and pulsing flesh everywhere. At the end of this chapter, you find yourself back where everything started. You emerge from the pit you once descended into and find yourself back at the gate in a red desert. Adler tells you that whatever you do now is in vain, that Commander Falk went out into that red desert and came back changed. He says that he's been here before countless times. As you head towards the Penrose, you see countless other Elsters dead. You've been here before, over and over and over. You try to get into the Penrose to return to Ariana to fulfill your promise, but your arm breaks off. You fail. You die. This is the game's fake ending. 
When you start a new game after the credits roll, it begins very much the way it did before. But after a moment, you realize that you've started earlier than you did the first time. You haven't crash-landed in a frozen wasteland yet, you're still traveling through the stars. This leads to the third chapter, which is set mostly in the memory of Rotfront, your memories of Ariana finally restored. The fake-out ending here is pretty effective, but I'll be honest, it kind of feels like a stunt to me once the moment has passed. If the game had ended there, I would have been very upset, because the story didn't feel concluded. I thought I'd gotten a bad ending, and I was ready to start over to see where I'd gone wrong. The trick Signalis is playing here is that everything that's happened in the game has been happening over and over and over again. Throughout the first section of Signalis, you get plenty of hints that the Serpensky facility is stuck in a time loop, living the same day over and over and over again. If you read Adler's diary, you can find that he keeps writing diary entries for the same day over and over again, a little different each time. When you beat the first boss, Adler surprises you by kicking you down an elevator shaft, which should be to your death. The only reason you survive is because your fall is broken by dozens and dozens of identical dead Elster units, Adler having kicked you down the shaft over and over and over again enough times that your bodies piled up all the way from the bottom at least three stories high. Adler is the only character who seems to understand that things are looping because of the King in Yellow's influence. It's worth noting that in dialogue, Adler's name is displayed in yellow, as opposed to the reds and blues of other characters. He is trying to stop Elster to kill her over and over and over again because she is trying to kill Ariana, and whatever ending to the game Elster gets, it will just start the time loop over again, which Adler wants to avoid. To understand what's going on here, we should look at two paintings. The Isle of the Dead by the Swiss painter Arnold Bachlin, and The Shore of Oblivion by the German painter Eugene Brockt. This is Isle of the Dead. This is also Isle of the Dead. Between the years of 1880 and 1886, Bachlin painted five different versions of Isle of the Dead, the same painting over and over again. One of these paintings, the fourth version, was destroyed during World War II, and now only exists in black and white photographs. This is The Shore of Oblivion by Eugene Brockt. This is also The Shore of Oblivion by Eugene Brockt. Over the course of his life, Brockt would paint eight different versions of The Shore of Oblivion. In both of these cases, the contents of the painting are always the same, but the little details change, creating different works. Signalis is obsessed with both of these paintings. They feature again and again and again. In that small radio room at the beginning of the game, the same one where we find the King in Yellow for the first time, we can see two photographs, each depicting one of these paintings. It's not hard to understand from the titles, Isle of the Dead and The Shore of Oblivion, are both concerned with heavy themes of death. Both works were left by the artist very much open to interpretation, but the theme of death within them is overbearing. So too, in Signalis, do these paintings represent death and futility. In the false ending, we see Elster silhouetted as she approaches the Penrose, and in her silhouette, we see flashes of both of these paintings cycling. Twice in first-person memory sequences, we find ourselves within the painting upon the shore of oblivion. Being transported like this into the very painting we've seen glimpses of throughout the story is a pretty incredible trick, and the game is confident enough to never directly call attention to what it's doing. These are the specific paintings which Ariana was obsessed with. Two paintings which the artists created over and over and over again. Two paintings about death. On the Penrose, we can discover that in her time aboard the ship, her 3,000 days there, 
Ariana was also painting these over and over and over again. Two of the primary named locations in the game are the Serpinski Station and Mandelbrot High School. The Serpinski Gasket and the Mandelbrot Set are both fractals, images recurring within themselves over and over and over again infinitely. This sort of repetition, seen in both the paintings chosen to be major plot elements and the fractals named, is one of the primary themes of Signalis. This is what is happening to both Lang and Rotfront. Ariana is still alive under the influence of the Red Eye, the cosmic being causing all of this who, in this universe, is associated with the cursed play The King in Yellow. We can find a note in Rotfront saying that myths exist about the Red Eye, a great being existing in the gas giant planet Rotfront orbits, although it is hand-waved away as paranoia about Yusan's surveillance state. In the Nowhere section, we can find a note about a dreamer. It reads, A prison from which the only escape is death. Deep below, the dreamer floats in a sea of flesh the Red Eye birthing a new world from their dream for eternity, and each time the dreamer turns over in their sleep, the world turns over too, until only flesh remains. I've seen some takes that Ariana is the Red Eye, her bioresonance transforming her into a godlike being, but I think this note indicates that the Red Eye is a discrete entity, one who is using Ariana, the dreamer, and torturing her to create the hellish existence the game depicts. Ariana is in constant pain, a living hell, and her bioresonance, her psychic powers, are overwriting reality the same way a replica's mind is overwritten by a copy of a copy of a copy. This is why the people in Serpinski are falling sick. Nausea, hair loss, dizziness. The same symptoms of radiation sickness that Ariana finds herself trapped in. The world is becoming a manifestation of Ariana, of her life, of her memories as she repaints reality again and again, trying to find happiness with Elster. Reality isn't meant to restart like this over and over and over again. Each time it does, things change. Each time it restarts, reality decays just a little. In the final moments of the game, just before the final boss fight, we can find notes from Adler. All efforts to contain this illness have been in vain. All the Gestalt workers have succumbed to it, leaving only dark shadows on walls and floors where they died. And soon, all of us replica will have lost our senses and turned to writhing masses of flesh. I now believe it was not an infectious disease, nor some form of poison or radiation. It was a slow corruption of reality itself. As I've relived the same cycle over and over, each time details changed, things are twisted, added, removed. How long until it all turns to nothing but noise? Issa Ito's ending shows the way Ariana's changing of reality has caused things to degrade. When we finally find her in her parents' bookstore on Rotfront, we find the truth. The Issa we've been seeing on Lang, the Issa in the game, was never real. She only ever existed as a figment of Ariana's imagination, a memory of her real childhood friend. When Issa realizes that she never existed, we can see her melt away before our eyes, turning into nothingness in a moment. In the bookstore, we can find a shrine to the two Ito twins implying that something happened while they were still in school and that they've been long dead, likely since before Ariana ever left on the Penrose mission. There are no gestalts left. Not on Leng, not on Rotfront, probably not anywhere. Humanity is dead except Ariana, leaving only shadows on the walls and floor. The writhing flesh below Lang is an amalgamation of the replicas who have gone through this over and over and over. One day, reality will crumble entirely, 
until only noise remains. Ariana needs Elster to keep her promise, and so she keeps waking Elster up and sending her through hell, begging her to remember her promise. No matter how many times Elster goes through this, though, no matter how many times she succeeds or fails, this hell that Ariana is going through and that the people of Yusan are going through will never end. Because the true Ariana isn't on Lang and isn't on Rotfront. The real Ariana may not even be on any planet, suspended in an eternal cryosleep in her pod, floating in darkness in the furthest reaches of space. In that sleep, she dreams, and her dreams are broadcast by her bioresonance, finding their way back to Yusan. Signalis. A signal. A dream about dreaming. There are three main endings to Signalis, leave, memory, and promise. Regardless of which of these endings you get, I don't believe it changes anything. Reality is still going to reset and degrade just a little more. Once you've entered the final boss sequence, Adler tells you you've been here countless times before, and Falk says Ariana will never dance with you again. Adler begs you to stop. Every time you reach an ending, everything starts again, and the world can't take much more. The first ending is Leave. This is gotten by playing the game very conservatively and quickly. It sees Elster unable to face Ariana within the Penrose, wandering into the desert and dying alone. The cycle begins again. The second ending is Memory. Elster enters the Penrose and finds Ariana. She comes to fulfill her promise, but Ariana cannot remember her. Elster asks to sit with Ariana just a moment longer and dies. The cycle begins again. The third ending is Promise, which is achieved by playing the game very aggressively and taking a long time. Ariana tells Elster that it's time to fulfill her promise, and Elster strangles her before dying herself. This, though, was not the real Ariana, just a signal, just a memory of her. And so, the cycle begins again. If all of that sounds bleak, then that's because it really is. Thankfully, there is one last ending. Throughout the game, there are three keys hidden in various locations. These keys are invisible, and can only be picked up when tuned to specific radio stations in the appropriate places. They are the key of love, the key of eternity, and the key of sacrifice. In one of the game's final rooms, just before you lock yourself into the final boss fight and ending, you find yourself back in the room where you started, where you first picked up the King in Yellow. In this room, as before, there is a safe with three padlocks on it. Each can be unlocked with one of the keys. Once the safe's number pad is clear, you must enter the code which was repeated on the radio all the way back at the beginning of the game. When you do this, the safe unlocks, and you can find a lily inside of it. Interacting with the lily begins the game's secret fourth ending, the artifact ending. Unlike the other endings, there is no fight with Falk here. There is no final confrontation with Adler. You've never been this far before, and you aren't doomed to perpetuate the cycle. Elster places the lily upon a pedestal and collapses below it. We see the bodies of other Elsters from other cycles below other pedestals, but none of those contain the lily, signifying, I think, that you have succeeded where every other Elster failed. A strangely shimmering artifact now sits upon the altar in the center of the pedestals. We see the Penrose being watched by the Red Eye. Inside the Penrose, Elster and Ariana, the real Ariana, I think, dance together. They embrace, and the game ends. There is a sinister reading of this, that the red eye at the end is still watching them trapped in the Penrose, living through their eternal hell. I think that this ending, though, is a positive one. Elster has completed the ritual. 
I think that the artifact on the altar at the end, the source of the flesh below Lang, is what was unearthed, and I think by placing the lily there, a plant which Ariana kept on the ship, she has formed a connection with Ariana. The artifact itself is an oblique reference to the Signalis logo. Elster has reached back as Ariana has reached out to her and broken the cycle. Yusan may still be doomed, in all likelihood it's too far gone, but now Elster has responded to Ariana's signal with her own. It's worth noting, while the phrase remember our promise is echoed throughout Signalis, it never says explicitly what that promise is. The most common read and the easiest read of Signalis is that the promise is to kill Ariana, that she must be freed from her pain. Here, though, we see Remember Our Promise flash one more time, and it is a peaceful note. Maybe the promise was never to kill Ariana. Maybe the promise was gentler than that. More hopeful. I think the reason the text does not say to remember your promise, but to remember our promise, is that the promise Elster has forgotten was the promise of two lovers to each other that they would love each other forever. The psychic hell that Ariana has trapped all of Yusan in is the result of that promise, her inability to let her lover go after death. In this final ending, Elster has realized after countless cycles the true way to save Ariana, by reaching back out to her the way Ariana has reached out across time, and across space, and across the boundary of death itself. She has woken Ariana up, and the two have found each other once again. Now the lovers are reunited, forever. They will be together in this pocket of reality where time and space have no meaning, and the cycle will end. They will love each other forever here. Truly forever until the end of time itself. Signalis is a really special game. It's surreal and difficult to parse at times, but beneath the terror of flesh and the dizzying presentation, this is a love story. It's a tragic story of two lovers who could never let each other go, even when the society they exist in treated them both as outcasts, and threw them away to die in the cold vacuum of space. I talked a lot about The King in Yellow in this video, the Robert W. Chambers book, and part of why I have a more optimistic reading on the game's secret ending than many I've seen online is because it is referencing The Mask quite specifically, quite directly. If Signalis just wanted to reference The King in Yellow to reference cosmic horror, they could have referenced any of the stories from that collection, but they reference The Mask specifically the only story from that collection which has a generally optimistic ending. The only story of those four which isn't a downer horror story. This is how I read the ending of Signalis, too, informed by those homages and references, to be unexpectedly uplifting just when things seem their bleakest. I talked about The Mask in this video, but I didn't actually talk about the ending of The Mask. But maybe you'd like to hear me talk about the story in more detail, and about the other three stories from Robert Chambers' collection which originated The King in Yellow. Well, I've got good news. With this video, I'm also launching a Patreon, and there I'll be periodically posting companion videos to the ones released over here on the main channel. Videos that delve deeper into something which is perhaps only tangentially related to the main topic of the video, but which I'd like to talk about in depth. The first video I'll be releasing there will be talking about the four King and Yellow stories for which the 1895 collection is titled The Repairer of Reputations, The Mask, In the Court of the Dragon, and The Yellow Sign. I'm launching the Patreon with only one tier. It's $5, and it'll give you access to the companion videos, and it'll get your name read out at the end of future videos. So if you want to hear me talk about a book instead of a game, here's your chance. 
It's been really amazing starting to grow a following here in the past few months, and I'd like to be able to focus more and more on the channel. More than just getting access to more videos from me, you'd be helping me keep making this sort of content, and that really would mean so much to me. If you can't afford to pledge to my Patreon, or just don't want to, then I totally get it. Hey, you've made it this far into a very, very long video about Signalis. I have other content covering horror games you might like, such as Slay the Princess or Grime, and I'll be covering more horror games in the future, so please consider subscribing. Maybe share the video with your friends if you liked it and you think they might too. But hey, just you being here is more than enough. I mean it. Until next time, I'm Zuldim, and I wear no mask. <laughs>